My name is Pavel. I'm from Analysis and Experimentation team. And I'm going to talk about the important topic of protecting users. So the challenge is that as we scale and start running more and more experiments, the possibility of introducing harm to users increases. And this happens for several reasons. Um, First, as it gets easier and easier to configure and run experiments, whether we want it or not, the bar for something to get in front of users uh, gets lower. So there is a higher possibility that a buggy feature or just a bad idea uh, actually makes it to, to real users. Also, because more experiments are running, there is just less manual monitoring of uh, each experiment. And then finally, uh, a lot of experiments are running concurrently, so there is also increased possibility of interruptions. Uh, and then, uh, as Paul mentioned, <coughs> experimentation system itself actually may be buggy and cause user harm, and you can use that approach with a holdout that Paul described to monitor and detect those issues. So I love this quote by uh, Mike Moran. Uh, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the prints, find more frogs, and kiss them faster and faster. So this really, on the one hand, highlights the benefits of experimentation. It's because we are poor at assessing the value of ideas, we want to try more and more ideas uh, to find the ones that work. But then, on the other hand, it's not actually you personally who gets to kiss the frogs, it's actually your users. Uh, so it's important to <laughs> minimize the amount of, of that unpleasant experience. So that's what we are going to uh, talk about. So what can we do? Um, the basic idea is that we want experimentation system to not just report out the results of experiments, but to become more intelligent. We want it to automatically analyze the results and then take action. So we want to do things like automatically detecting bad experiments, sending alerts to experiment owners, and in case of extreme badness, shutting down the experiments automatically. Now this doesn't look very hard, but the challenge is that we want to do it fast, in seconds or in, in minutes. And then there is actually two challenges, one on the engineering side, that you need to have that real-time data per client delivering the data to make those decisions. Uh, and also on the statistical side, even though eventually your experiment may have millions of users, in the first minute, uh, there is probably not that much data. And it's very easily dominated by bots or, or outliers. Um, for example, in the early days of Bing, one thing that we tried is to just alert based on event counts. So we would, for example, compute the number of clicks that happened in treatment, uh, the number of clicks that happened in control, and if there is a big delta and statistically significant, we would shut down the experiment. Well, that actually didn't work. Well, a lot of false positives were just shutting down good experiments all the time because there are so many uh, bots and outliers. So how to do it correctly, probably somewhat domain dependent. Uh, one thing that we found useful is to aggregate from event level to user level. So then what happens is that if you had a bot which say submitted 100 queries in the first uh, minute of your experiment, now it becomes just one data point, it's not 100 data points. So that helps uh, reduce false positives. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can start small and then ramp up. We can start the experiment maybe at just half percent of traffic, uh, and then check whether everything is okay, and if everything is good, then ramp it up to the desired 20 percent or whatever the number is. And it's even better if the system can actually do it automatically for us, check and ramp up. Uh, this Half percent, of course, will not be enough to absorb any changes in your metrics of interest, but if there is something egregiously bad happening, then you will be able to detect it. Now, this helps a lot to <coughs> reduce the impact of 
to add uh, experiments to just a few users. But if you are the unlikely user who happened to fall in that half percent, well, your life is still bad. Um, now, what can you do to help with that? One way is to run experiments with partial exposure. For example, if you were running a Bing experiment, you could decide that we'll only apply the treatment to one out of 10 queries which qualify for the treatment. So then what will happen is that if the user is in a bad experiment, then they can just reformulate their query, and chances are they're going to get a normal default experience. So this will help uh, with preventing users uh, being stuck in bad experiments for a long time, but it also has disadvantages that user experience gets inconsistent, different queries, you get uh, different experiences, and also user metrics get diluted, they're pretty much going to be useless. In this case, you'll have to analyze it at a query level, which again suffers from all these outlier and bot issues. So there is some trade-off here, and you have to experiment and see whether uh, this would work for you. Okay, now let me talk about the interactions. So what is an interaction? Interaction happens if exposing the users to uh, multiple experiments at the same time, the effect of that is not the same as the sum of the effects of the individual experiments. So there is a great quote uh, by Aristotle, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So this is an example of an interaction. This is what we call a positive or synergetic interaction. This is, of course, a very inspiring quote. Uh, when I was preparing uh, for this presentation, I came across uh, this other quote. Uh, this is from one of the characters from a book by Wendelin Van Dranen, which says, sometimes these people, the call is less than the sum of the parts. <laughs> this is a lot less inspiring, but this is an interaction too. Uh, this is what we call a negative or antagonistic interaction. So coming back to the domain of uh, software, there is this very famous example of a negative interaction that if you change the color of the font on your page to blue, that may be fine. If you change the background of the page to blue, that may be okay too. But if you do both at the same time, it's going to be a disaster. Um, and then the positive example is suppose you have a site consisting of five pages and you improve the header uh, of the page, make navigation more convenient. If you test it on just one page at a time, maybe you see a little bit of positive effect, but if you test it on the site as a whole, then you likely will see much stronger positive effect because now the navigation on the whole site is consistent. Uh, so these are, of course, hypothetical examples. How often do interactions really happen in practice? Well, what we find is that if um, adequate prevention measures are in place, interactions are actually very rare. Um, for example, in Bing, uh, we run over 10,000 experiments. A year, we only observe about one interaction per month. So, but this is if we have the prevention uh, set up in place. So how do we prevent interactions? Suppose you have two experiments, E1 and E2, you are suspecting there may be an interaction between them, uh, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is to just run them sequentially. You run E1, once it finishes, uh, you run E2. So that avoids an interaction, but now the team that wants to run the second experiment has to wait. So that's not ideal. Another thing you can do is run non-overlapping experiments. And this diagram here illustrates the difference between overlapping and non-overlapping. Uh, so let's look at the overlapping first. Uh, in this case, every experiment gets assigned its own independent hash. So here, for experiment E1, we get a hash seed hash1. And that hash seed defines uh, this hash space, this line here, which sometimes we call a number line. So every user, uh, based on their ID, is going to get hashed into some point uh, on this number line. And then you can 
think of an experiment as just a subregion of, of the space. So these are all the users um, which are in the experiment P1. So similarly, for experiment P2, you get another hash seed, hash2, it defines its own hash space, user gets hash somewhere on this, uh, in this number line, and since hash1 and hash2 are different independent hash seeds, there's some probability this user may end up being in both experiments at the same time. And that's why they're called overlap. So that's the overlapping setup. Now, in the non-overlapping case, if you don't want the experiments to overlap, what we can do is simply assign the same hash seed to both experiments. So here we have this hash seed hash3. It defines on the hash space, the number line. And then each of the two experiments is now a subregion uh, of the same hash space. And when we hash the user, uh, it can only end up in one of these experiments, never in both. So in this way, um, we can prevent the interaction and run both experiments at the same time. The cost here, of course, that now we have a limit on how large our experiments can be. For example, if E1 already occupies 40% of, uh, of traffic, then E2 may not be larger than 60%. While in the overlapping case, every experiment can use 100% of that. Okay, so I mentioned that interactions do not happen very often, but when they do happen, we want to detect them. So here is an illustration of how you can do it. Suppose we have an experiment E1, um, all, all the users in E1 are represented by this blue circle here, is treatment E1, control C1, and we are interested to know whether there is an interaction um, between this experiment and another experiment E2, uh, is treatment E2 and control C2. So because E1 and E2 are running in parallel, in overlapping ways, there will be some users in E1 who are also in E2 at the same time. <laughs> These are denoted by this orange circle here. And I separately um, separated out users and treatment in E2 and control in E2. So now what uh, we will do is we will compute the treatment control delta for this metric that we are interested in um, for users in this circle, which are in the treatment of E2, and compare it to the same quantity for users in this circle, applying the control. So imagine if there was no experiment E2, then these circles would just be random samples of users from E1. And then, of course, we are computing the same quantity, there wouldn't be any statistically significant difference. So now, if there is E2 and we actually see a statistically significant difference, that means it is caused by the E2 and there is an interaction. So we can perform this procedure on all pairs of the overlapping experiments to detect all of the uh, two-way interactions. It's actually, if you're running a lot of experiments, actually may be quite computationally intensive. This number of metrics times, times number of experiments squared. Uh, and also it's a lot of tests, so you will need to do something to control for type one error. This is what you can do to um, detect interactions. Okay, so to sum up, um, as you start running more and more experiments, it's important that you develop some automated ways to protect users. And the basic idea is that experimentation system needs to become more intelligent and start automatically analyzing the results of the experiments and take an action. And some of the things that we can do are sending alerts, shutting down bad experiments, starting small and then ranking up, and then preventing and detecting interactions. Any questions? Yes. If you identify any interaction and it is positive interaction, are you implementing the positive interaction? Or are you just detecting them? So it depends. Once we detect an interaction, we want to 
analyze what the impact of it is. Generally, we are concerned, again, with uh, some harm to users. So if there is no harm to users, we may just continue running it, we'll analyze it, analyze it both ways, including the interaction segment and exclusion interaction segment. If there is some harm to users, then we would shut down one of the experiments. Questions? Yes. Just one thing to try to fix it. Uh, it's going to interact with the parts of the site. So you have something like two totally different parts of the site, and they're unlike the parent site. Mm -hmm. Search and then just the other. So it's worth it to build that for the full test and stuff like that, or just do that with the So we do have those prevention mechanisms, and they are usually, the way we build it is, is by team. So every Every team would get, say, one hash space or a couple of hash spaces because experiments from the same team are most likely to interact. Experiments from completely different teams working on completely different parts of the site are unlikely to interact. So we'll do it that way, and sometimes teams would run overlapping experiments or non-overlapping experiments. And if there is, <laughs> happens to be an interaction, which again is rare in your scenario, <coughs> we will detect it. Hi everybody, I'm Somit Gupta. I'm going to talk uh, about designing experimentation metrics. So, but before I do that, I want to talk about rats. So, in 1902, the French Quarter in Hanoi was overrun by rats. And um, the governor general at that time, he instituted a scheme, a de-ratization scheme uh, where you would pay every citizen uh, a reward for capturing and killing a rat. So, and the proof requested for payment was just the rat's tail because you don't want like a huge pile of rat corpses in front of a government building. Um, so, uh, this started in April and um, in the first week they were killing around 1,000 rats a day. And by the second week, they, they, they made a lot of progress. 4,000 rats a day were being killed on average. In a few months, by July, they were killing 20,000 rats a day. So by this metric, this scheme was a giant success. It was amazing. Uh, there was one problem. It did not make a dent in the original problem. So people uh, were still noticing so many rats in their quarters. There was no effect on uh, their quarters being overrun by rats. So um, they started digging deeper into what might be the causes here, and they found two very interesting observations. One, there were a lot of tailless rats in the city. <laughs> and two, there was a budding rat farming industry which had come up in, in these months. So people were actually farming rats, cutting off their tails, and, and getting the money. So on the face of it, this metric looks really good, um, having how many rats you kill today. But in actuality, this metric moves in the opposite direction of your objective. The more rats are being killed is probably a sign of more rats being breeded, rather than the rats being eliminated from, your, um, from the city. So in a data-driven process, having the right metric is very important. And in an experimentation-driven product development where you're using experiments to make the ship decision, the question uh, about like whether this feature is good or bad is not like how do you feel about it or how do you, what do you think about it. It's did it move the metric. And if you have the wrong metric, you, you'll be left with just the rat tails. So it's very important to have the right set of metrics to analyze uh, the results of the experiment. So um, in Microsoft, whenever we um, analyze an experiment, uh, generally we will have hundreds of metrics that will compute at the end of the experiment. And all these metrics have uh, different roles, which we can classify into four major roles, which I want to talk about in more detail. So, the first thing you want to do when you analyze the result of the experiment 
is to make sure that you can say that my results are trustworthy. If can I trust the metrics in the scorecard or in my analysis to make the shift decision or not? I'm more often than you would think you would find some issues uh, when the experiment has run. And so it is very good to have a good set of data quality metrics that you can look at first to make sure that your um, experiment results are trustworthy. Um, one very useful result is sample ratio, or metric is sample ratio mismatch metric, which um, uh, my colleague Paul uh, Ralph alluded to in the past. Um, and also, you can have metrics like data loss, click reliability, or cookie churn metrics, which, which might indicate that the rest of the metrics in your analysis are, are somewhat, somewhat biased. So make sure that your results are trustworthy. Uh, that's, that's the first step. Second, then once you've made sure your results are trustworthy, then you want to know whether your treatment was successful. And uh, can you ship this treatment? So um, to understand whether your treatment or is successful or not, you will, you will have a set of metrics called the overall evaluation criteria metrics or OEC metrics. These OEC metrics, um, you would usually have a, it's ideal to have a single metric and at the most a very few uh, key metrics. Because if you have a long list of metrics, then a few would move in the positive direction, few will move in the negative direction. And then you're left with a subjective decision on top of them. Depending on who's in the room, they, they might weight the different metrics differently. So if you even have multiple objectives, it's good to have the weights on those multiple objectives predefined. So the whole organization or the whole company is following the same strategy. Otherwise, it could happen one team is increasing this on the cost of this, another team is increasing this on the cost of this, and at the end of the year, you, you just like kind of seesawed between the two metrics. Um, so OEC metrics, uh, what makes a good OEC metric? There are two key properties of a good OEC metric. One is uh, directionality, and the uh, other is sensitivity. So what is, um, what do I mean by directionality? Like when would you ship a change to your product? You'd want to ship a change to your product if it improves the long-term goals of your company or of your business. So your OEC should be aligned with that direction. It should be aligned with the long-term goals of your company. So that is what I mean by directionality. What do I mean by sensitivity? By sensitivity, I mean that um, you should be able to impact that metric. You should be able to make changes to your product that can impact that metric. And that pro metric should be sensitive enough that it, it will, you will be able to detect those changes in that metric. A um, lot of products, you can think every product has key performance indicators that, that are tracked religiously and reported. So a lot of people think that, oh, like it's simple. My key KPIs are my OEC because that's what I care about. But um, there is a difference between OECs and KPIs. So KPIs are generally lagging metrics. You measure them month over month, year over year, or quarter over quarter, and uh, to understand the health of your product. It's kind of like after the fact. But OEC metrics are leading indicators which indicate long-term improvement in those key KPI metrics, but you're able to measure them in a very short duration of time, like the experiment duration period, which is usually around two weeks. So um, let's take a concrete example to kind of go through some of these points. Um, let's take a uh, try to design an OEC for a search engine. So uh, KPIs for a search engine would be query share and revenue. So do you think queries per user and revenue per user would be a good OEC metric that you can ship based uh, that, that you can ship on? Let, if this was your OEC metric, then um, let's take a real example from Bing. Like in one of the treatments in an experiment, there was a ranking bug which degraded search results. I think that similar to the point you were trying to make. Um, so what happened was that 
because the search results were degraded, people had to issue multiple queries to get to an answer. And also the ad certainly looked more, much more relevant than the actual search results. So people were clicking on ads more. So as a result, our query volume went up by 10%. And revenue went up by 30%. So regardless of OEC, good or bad OEC, this should ring alarm bells like Troy Man's Law, like this is too interesting to happen in real life, so something is wrong. And definitely this is not a good OEC uh, to ship your experiments on. Otherwise, the whole team would be actively working towards making search results worse and worse and worse. So um, that prompts the question then, what should be a good OEC? How, how do we determine an experiment is successful for a search engine? Um, so one way to do it is to kind of decompose your uh, your KPI metric into smaller pieces. So one way you can do that is that, okay, you want to increase queries per month, that is your KPI. So let's decompose it. So you will have a certain number of users who show up on your product uh, for, for a particular month. Those users uh, visit your product a few times to perform a particular task. So, and then for each task, they're doing some queries, right? So, um, the first term, users per month, we, uh, in an A-B experiment setting, we, we predetermine how many users, what percentage of users should go to treatment versus to the control. So we cannot uh, really measure any increase in users because by design, we, we've made sure we'll get equal users in treatment and control. So we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot increase this one to increase the total queries per month. Um, the other uh, key observation uh, is that on to increase queries per session or queries per task, because that would mean that users have to ma make more search queries to finish the same task. So it's, it's more tax on them to finish their task. So that, that doesn't seem optimal either. So what we are left with is the mi middle term, sessions per user or number of visits per user. So that, if you can increase that in an experiment duration, that would make sure and that would be much very indicative of increase in queries per month because people are coming back to Bing or to Google again and again and performing more tasks and as a result they're, they're performing more queries and there will be a sustainable long-term increase in queries per month. Um, so, so far so good? Okay, great. So, let's take another, uh, so that, that actually solves one problem, right? Directionality. The second, second property of a good OEC was sensitivity, that we should be able to change, uh, impact it and measure that change. So sensitivity, uh, we, we usually know that, that sessions per user, it, it rarely moves in our experiments. Uh, the reason being that it's really hard, it's, it's basically changing user behavior. Like if you come to Bing every morning, we want you to come morning and evening so that there are two, two visits. So it's very hard to do that in a very small period of time in an experiment duration. And um, also there are some statistical properties which make it hard, uh, harder for uh, sessions per user to be sensitive. Uh, Alex will cover, cover more of it in the next session. So what do we do now? Uh, what we've done for Bing is that we've, we've created surrogate metrics for, which are more sensitive but indicative of in, increase in sessions per user. So we have a very rich telemetry for, for Bing, so we have much more signals that we can utilize to understand whether a particular task or a particular visit for a user was successful or not. Um, and we found that if we can find user success by those, those particular parameters, that is usually indicative of increase in sessions per user as, as well. So, um, now, uh, that, this is for search engine. Let me give you a couple more examples of OECs and other products. Um, Netflix, I'm sure uh, a lot of you know and use Netflix. It's a subscription business where they, they take um, monthly subscription fee and you can binge watch 
lot of TV shows and maybe a few movies. Um, so their KPI that they care about is retention, that users keep coming back month over month, and they keep paying month over month as a result. And uh, their OEC is um, viewing hours, how, how, how much content, uh, how long you've been viewing the content. And that is because they found that they, that has a strong correlation between retent, that there is a strong correlation between retention and viewing hours. Um, Coursera, um, again, I, I don't need to explain what Coursera is. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, do we measure KPIs in an experiment uh, analysis? The answer is yes, but their role is different in the experiment, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, any other questions? So do we measure, like, Client as in user satisfaction, yes, user. which is very hard to measure. Yeah, so um, the user visit is supposed to be like a, a, a proxy for user satisfaction. And we, I'll talk a little bit more about how we start simple and we, we, can, we can improve on that. But that is how we are trying. It's a hard problem to me measure user satisfaction in a short period of time um, and without asking them, <laughs> like, hey, are you satisfied? Um, so well, I'll talk a little bit more about them. But yeah, that is kind of, I think, the crux of a good OEC is that you, you capture that you're delighting your users. Yeah, you're trying to measure the search success, which in the previous slide, uh, didn't say what success is. It is actually a whole team in BIM of like five data scientists who are working on figuring out what is success and continuously improve them. So yes, we are, we are attempting to measure it by the service we have. Yeah. Any other questions? So um, Coursera, it's, um, it cares about course completion and uh, it issues certifications uh, through which it makes money. So its KPIs are um, course completions, number of certifications issued, and revenue. And um, the OEC um, that they use for their experiments is the test completion rate. Um, you must have seen like they pop up quizzes once you go through like one fourth of the lesson, and also course engagement, how, how engaged you are with the course in general, and they found that to be very predictive of like course completion and certificates sold. Um, so um, now, how to come up like you, you guys are from a diverse set of companies and and work on different products. How, you must be thinking how can how can we come up with an OEC for each each different product, and it is hard. We 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 recognize that. Um, here's our um, uh, our recommendation that in the beginning just start simple, very simple. Uh, like essentially, a lot of OECs boil down to improving user satisfaction because you want them to come back more, use your product more, and as a result, as a byproduct, you will have more revenue over time. Over time. Uh, so start simple, like frequency of user visits is a very good extrinsic signal that um, users are happy. It, um, and it's very hard to game like for anybody. Um, so start with that, and then you can also run a few learning experiments in the beginning. Uh, like you can introduce a change that is certainly uh, positive. Like, major like it's a general opinion that showing ads is a tax to the user that is um, that is necessary to generate revenue. So if, if you can run an experiment where, where you remove the ads, so that, that should increase user satisfaction because you remove that tax. And see if your actual OEC metric improves or not, um, because uh, that is indicative of user satisfaction. A lot of times you don't have like obvious positive things and that you can actually test for. But it's very easy to come up with negative things that you can do to the product to kind of um, 
uh, impact the user satisfaction negatively. So you can also do a learning experience where you add like latency or degrade search results to see that if your metrics are sensitive enough to actually detect um, those changes or that decrease in user satisfaction or not. Um, over time, as you as you start experimenting more and more, you you can continue to improve uh, the directionality and sensitivity by um, creating a corpus or, or or labeled set of experiments where you you already know uh, or you you have it's widely agreed that hey this experiment improves user satisfaction this was terrible for users this is kind of neutral and once you have this kind of a test set then you can have lots of ideas like, hey, let me incorporate this signal into our OEC because I think this is actually indicative of user satisfaction. So again, that, there'll be a lot of opinions on how to define that metric. So to do it objectively, what you'll do is you'll define that, make that change to the metric, and then test it against this test set of experiments and see in which experiments did that metric move positively, in which experiments did it move negatively, and does it uh, agree with the labels that you um, you'd given in your test set. And um, if it agrees more, then it's a better change in terms of directionality. If it's less or it's not, it's almost the same, then it's probably not, not a good change. You're making your metric more complex without getting any benefit. Um, so this covers um, the data quality and OEC metrics. The, you're not done yet. Like you know, your treatment was successful. You know, your results are trustworthy. But there are other things also you need to look at. Uh, one is um, you need to make sure you don't have an undue harm to your um, guardrail metrics. So guardrail metrics are not the ones you're like trying to optimize for. They are the metrics you're trying to make sure that you don't do an undue harm to them. So like revenue uh, or your KPI metrics would end up in in a guardrail uh, section and also performance. So adding like a new feature might have attacks on performance, but you want to make sure it's not like an undue harm to performance. Um, so you, you want to make sure um, that you're, before you ship, you, you, you check those metrics as well. And then uh, finally, and this is the big bulk of metrics, hundreds of metrics that we have, are local feature and diagnostic metrics. So the first three just told you, first told you, your, your, your data quality is good. Second and third told you what happened, what, what would be the impact of this experiment. The fourth is telling, or is helping you answer why did the, uh, the um, metric move or did not move. So these are local feature metrics where you're like tracking clicks on every different part of your product page and like impressions of, uh, or visits on different parts of your product. So you have a very rich and detailed breakdown of those metrics. So you can form a hypothesis to say that, oh, I see clicks on this part of the, because of the treatment, users are clicking more on this part of the page, which is leading to some other effects. And you can have a reasonable hypothesis supported by these multiple data points to say that, okay, I understand what, what is potentially happening, which is improving or degrading our OEC metrics or our guardrail metrics. Um, this is, um, Having a rich set of uh, metrics in your uh, analysis is very important. And it's also equally important to interpret them correctly. In, in, there are situations where you have the experiment run correctly, configured correctly, you have the right set of uh, metrics, but you still can end up making the wrong conclusion by looking at the exact same uh, set of metrics. So we're going to talk more about this in detail um, on, on Thursday, um, as part of our paper uh, on common metric interpretation pitfalls. But um, just to give you um, um, a trailer, uh, here's an example from MSN uh, homepage. So MSN homepage is basically shows a bunch of links to, to different articles you might be interested in. In control, when you click on a link, it'll, 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 it'll basically open the page in that same tab. So you'll move to the article, and if you want to come back to the home page, you click the back button. In, uh, in treatment, instead of opening it in the same tab, it, it opens it up in the new tab. So it, this was like a one-line JavaScript change where now you open clicks in a new tab. Um, 
Well, when we analyzed this experiment, we saw 8% increase in the performance uh, for this page, specifically the time to load the home page went up by 8%. So that was a large increase. And it was surprising because like, we just made like a one line change. So um, this was very surprising and we couldn't, we couldn't uh, understand what might be happening here. Um, the reason here was that there was a, what we call a metric level sample ratio mismatch. In, um, in treatment, there were fewer home page impressions or home page loads because in treatment, the home page was already there. When the user wanted to come back, they would just go switch the tab to go to the home page. In control, you had to click the back button to, to load the home page again. So the, when you click the back button to load the home page again, it's like second page load, which is usually faster because you've cached a lot of content on your browser already. So those are very fast. Whereas in treatment, there was no back button because you opened it up in a new tab. So users were just uh, going back to the same tab. So the, the slower page loads were left in treatment. Um, so here, the, the two uh, populations, the treatment and control populations were very different. So you cannot make a, a, a causal argument or, or a fair comparison between those two populations. It's not that this change co caused a slowdown in the page. It's just that this change, change changed the population of pages differently so, um, so that um, the average page load time has gone up. So um, well, these kind of pitfalls can like, kind of make you like, not ship this change when actually, for all other things, it was a very positive change. Um, for, for more uh, examples, I'll, I'll encourage you to, to uh, come to our talk and read our paper as well. Um, quick summary, um, having good metrics is very critical um, in a data-driven process for sure. Um, what you get is most of the times what you've measured. Um, metrics, for, especially for in experimentation setting, have different types and roles. Make sure you have a comprehensive <coughs> metric set that you analyze at the end of an experiment. And um, OEC, designing OECs is not trivial. It's a hard process. Um, it has to be indicative of a long-term increase in your uh, business goals. And um, I, we recommend to start simple and then continue to iteratively improve it. And um, even after you have a good metric set, make sure you do not fall into some common uh, interpretation pitfalls. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? I have a question about the design of OEC. Uh -huh. And so you do some set of learning experiments and choose metrics which is better correlates with some uh, results. But mm -hmm. you have some thousands of metrics mm -hmm. and it can be just a coincidence. Um, sometimes you understand it easily if it's CTR of six results. Right. So it cannot be a good metric for user's happiness. But sometimes it can look very good, but how do you check that it's not a coincidence? That's a, so the question is that um, we, 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 we prescribe that you can have learning experiments and use them to kind of um, design your OEC. Um, but how do you make sure that like correlation is actually like in the right direction? It, it is. It is not just a correlation, and there is no causation. Um, so that's why it's uh, it's more about validating the current OEC rather than like using them to kind of like um, data mine for the right metric. So once you have a good OEC, um, that you 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 have enough um, faith in that. Okay, this is what I think user behavior should be like. Then you can use that to validate that OEC. There are also papers on, like, um, the paper by Google called Heart versus Pulse Metrics. So it talks about, like, um, what kind of metrics are good metrics for measuring user happiness and what are their uh, properties. Um, mostly, like, a good OEC metric uh, should be extrinsic, in, not intrinsic in the sense, like, increasing clicks or decreasing clicks can be done by a developer change. But, um, Increasing the number of visits, user times users visit to your product, like no telemetry change can make that happen. So th those are also like some some in interesting or important points that you should keep in keep in mind.
but those uh, learning experiments and even corpus are more validation than like looking for the right metric. So, um, so this is the last section of today. <clears throat> the purpose of this section is um, mainly to give people an, an idea about active research areas, recent development. Um, first, we want people to understand, even from for the uh, theoretical statistics perspective, just way beyond the simple two sample t test about you know on A/B testing. So there's still a lot of challenges of open questions. Um, so I try to cover as much as possible uh, the top four, um, but for the interest of time, I will try to stop at uh, at five and you know leave time for questions, uh, and then we can leave whatever left after the Q and A. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm mainly going to cover these uh, first four. Uh, challenges, natural sensitivity. Uh, you heard a lot about you know insensitiveness of key metrics like session per user, um, and then we also heard problems about p-value misinterpretation, p-value hacking, multiple testing, things like that, um, and also this somewhat related to what if you know we have the system, you can continuously look at your results, and how do you you know make use of that? Can you make you know, sequential decisions at any time during your experiment and early stop. Um, and if I have time, I'm gonna talk about something uh, about hydro, you know, uh, effect heterogeneity, uh, because so far what we talk about is uh, average treatment effect. It's like, you know, what is on average you know, the effect of the treatment? But in, 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 in fact, we all know that uh, there's a huge variation between subject to subject. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to cover some other interesting problems. You know, interestingly, there's time effect, you know, time varying effects. There might be some delay in the effect if some, somebody asks uh, re relevant questions. Um, and also, in terms of uh, you know, network, you have this interference. You can also understand, uh, think about this as a leakage. So there's, these sort of viol violate some fundamental uh, assumptions people make when doing cause inference. Uh, these are all very you know, challenging, interesting problems. Uh, you can find, I think you can find a couple of uh, relevant uh, publications in this area, in, uh, even in this is KDD, I believe. Okay. So sensitivity of the metric. Um, most people, when they talk about sensitivity, they think about statistical power. Okay. But in fact, it you know, de depends on how you define sensitivity. Uh, in intuitive definition is, if I do these experiments, how likely am I going to see some, you know, this matrix uh, move in a statistically significant way? So I know it's truly moved. Okay, and then you know, if we think about this probability of detect the true movement, you can decompose them into two simple, you know, two components. The first component you you have to make some effect. Okay, so the effect is not zero. By the way, when we say the effect is not hypothesis is effect is zero, we don't really mean it's absolutely zero. It's you know, typically you it's some tiny changes, but all time, there's some minimum changes that you really care about, right? So when I say there's a true movement, I mean a true movement beyond certain you know, minimum changes. And then the other component is, given you made such changes, what is the chance you're going to detect this uh, in, a, in a significant way? And the power only quantifies the first component, right? That's given the alternative is true. It's like given you made this change, this effect, you can detect it. But it you know, doesn't help you to quantify the second part, which is you know, in, in all, like how, how good is your idea? Right? I have, you have these 100 ideas you try. How, how many of them are truly uh, moving the metrics that you intend to move? And therefore, if we talk about a lack of sensitivity of certain metrics, it's interesting to under, important to understand which part is the, is the problem. If the problem is the power, okay, that's the first case, then typically you can do these things. You can, you can increase traffic. Like if you run 5%, you can increase this to 10%, 20%. Uh, this is also called power up uh, in, uh, in our jargon. So like when we say you need power up, you mean you run larger flight, run larger experiments. But it's limited to capacity, right? You have these total user base. The most you know, uh, in terms of power, you should split up 
user basing to 50% versus 50%, that's the maximum power you can get. But this is, you, know, you, you only have this amount of user. Um, but another idea is just to run longer experiments, right? That in intuitively run longer, you get more traffic. But surprise, running experiment longer won't always help. And a separate idea is like, in, in term, in, instead of increasing sample size, you can also try to reduce the variance. Okay? And this is sort of this orthogonal to increase uh, sample size. We're also going to talk about it. Uh, and the last point is you can also try to change the, the thing you estimate. Okay? The terminology is called estimate. Um, you know, sometimes average is hard to move. You can do something. You might, you might move something to positive, something to negative, but on, on the average, it's the movement is small. Um, and, and also for the highly skilled metrics, you know, even the, the average for the convergence to normality is also slow. So you can do some transformations and, for example, do capping or truncation uh, on highly skilled metrics. Um, but whenever you do these transformations, it's also you know, come with the caution of how you do, how you interpret the metric after the transformations. And then this, you know, you can use number match test, like, like rank sum test, uh, but also the problem is in the interpretation, okay? A lot of people misunderstood uh, you know, rank sum test as comparing the median, but actually it's, it's not. So why run experiment longer won't always help? Okay. So T stat is, it's basically the ratio of the delta divided by the standard error, which is square root of the variance of the delta. If we assume, assume the percentage change, the relative effect is stable. Right? So I'm you know, rewriting delta into percent delta, then I'm just doing some simple trick by you know, writing the, the, the denominator into the ratio of sample size divided by the standard deviation divided over, over the mean. Um, Increasing sample size will, will make the t-stat larger because you're, you're increasing the sample size on the numerator. Okay? Um, and normally, it's, you know, it should make your uh, state of power increase. But however, the catch here is we are assuming the standard deviation over mean on the denominator remains to be the same. That's you know, usually true in areas like psychology, you run experiments on different you know, students, and they should have a stable standard deviation and mean. Right? But however, in online cases, you know, you're continually monitoring the users, right? And then running one week versus running two weeks, all the user mix, you know, mixture distributions are quite different. Like even the mean should change, right? The average of queries per user or reference revenue per user for one week should be slow, should be smaller than the value for two weeks. Make sense? So there's no such, so this assumption of this denominator remains stable is just wrong for a lot of metrics. Question? Do you always uh, compute metrics at the user level? Or do you always Good question. So the question is, this seems to be this question, this, very, this problem is special for the user level metrics. Um, we do have a lot of user metrics, but we also compute the other level metrics, like page level metrics or session level metrics. How do you get around uh, IIDs? That's a separate question. We let's take it offline. It's a very important question. Good, good question. Uh, we have, uh, yeah. So let's take it offline. Um, but then, what surprises us is for certain metrics like session per user, which we really want to move. The when we run the experiment longer, we have more and more sample size. But somehow, the standard deviation over mean also increased at a similar pace. That's what I'm showing here on the graph. Right? So when we take the ratio, these two so effects sort of cancels out. Right? And, and your, your, your mileage may vary. Right? If you run on a different population, different metrics, this thing might increase or decrease. Uh, in our case, it's just sort of cancels out. So a, a very surprising uh, realization. And that leads to another orthogonal uh, idea. You know, can we reduce variance? Then in these cases, you know, we're not trying to uh, 
use sample sizes to, to, to make these stats larger, we will try to uh, find another delta, which I call delta star, which had these two properties. Right? It's, it has the same mean as the original delta. So, I, so this delta star, although it's different from delta, is trying to estimate the same thing as the original delta people are familiar with. So that's good. Uh, but it has smaller variance. Okay. How you know how how do we do that? The the, the basic motivation is uh, it's called baseline adjustment, right? So we know our you this this mixtures in the user populations, right? We can name a lot of other like gender, age, things. Um, here I'm just using you know the heavier user and light user. These are sort of universal in in all, all products um, because of randomization, right? So again, each randomization, remember what Paul mentioned about, you know, we should, ideally we want to pick randomization that makes the two group exactly the same, right? But if you're not doing a lot of you know, effort trying to make things exactly the same, in, in, in reality, in practice, typically, there's some you know, natural variance between treatment that's why you see 5% type of error even in AA test. Right? Okay. And if in this more heavy users in treatment than in control, then you will expect the treatment should have larger query per user, session per user, revenue per user than control, just based on that. Right? So these are sort of the, the delta you should expect just from the baseline which is the difference in heavier percentage of heavier users in this case. Okay? So mathematically, you can decom decompose your variance into these two components. The second component is the variance of the expect expected delta, just given the expected delta of the baseline. So these parts, that part of variance is what can be explained by the baseline x. And we would, we, the idea is trying to eliminate or to reduce that part. So the, the, the procedure is extremely simple. Um, we define our new delta star as the delta uh, minus some theta times uh, delta of x, where x here is some, some, some uh, observations. And we know that these, the, the expectation of this new delta star is going to be the same as the old delta, as long as the delta of x on average is 0. Okay, this is the only requirement. We need to find such delta x so that we call it baseline, so that this baseline expected va uh, value of this baseline delta is zero. What does that mean? It just means that these are things that's not going to be affected by the experiment, by the treatment you're experimenting. Okay, so what, so what I just you know use the, the example in the example I just show you the percentage of heavier and light users, you can sort of learn these things using the historical data from your, your users. And similarly for like things like gender, you know, everything, all the data you know before you run experiment, they are a good baseline. Okay? So that's why we call this procedure uh, country experiment using pre-experiment data. Okay? So, but then how do we pick theta? Right. This actually works for, for any theta. For any theta, you have this property, they have the same mean. But remember, the task is we want to make the variance as small as possible. So we just pick the theta, they minimize the variance. Okay. And there's a closed formula to do that. It's very easy to do. Okay. A simple extension is here. I'm just using a linear adjustment. Uh, in practice, we found it often is good enough. But you can reach bad adjustment to find to use some nonlinear functions. So theoretically, the best optimal adjustment is of this form: uh, minus some theta zero, plus some delta of f one and delta of f zero, where f one and f zero are the true regression of your y in treatment given your baseline and your y in control given your baseline. So you sort of need to fit these two models in your treatment control separately. But in practice, like I said. Linear adjustment works just fine. You might squeeze a 5%, 10% more variance reduction by doing very complicated things. But, uh, but that's an interesting theme, right? In these cases, you sort of connect the machine learning 
uh, literature to A-B testing. You can use whatever your favorite super, supervised learning algorithms here. So what about the true movement? The problem is not the power, but the, really your ideas are not, just not that good. They just don't move the metric. Um, and the perfect design metrics is not actionable if you cannot move it in a typically one week or two week window. And then you can sort of, re, you just need to re-engineer your metric, right? So you know that those AECs at different stage of experiment needs to change, right? At the start of your product, uh, you probably, your, your product, you know, your user base grows a lot. You can use something like daily active users or session per user to easily, these things can be easily moved. But once your product get to a more mature stage, you have to switch your, your OEC to something that's easier to move. And in our cases, in being, we mentioned that we, we look from session per user to the user satisfaction, uh, try to model the session success rate. Uh, these, and also the time to the first success indicator. Okay. And another idea is, can we just come up with some surrogate metrics from the existed you know, pool of metrics that we know they tend to move a lot? Can we just you know, make a combo metrics out of these that mimics the, you know, the, the, the desired OEC? Well, the challenge here is that the naive linear regression might be misleading. The, the naive way is I have these 10 metrics. I have this one metrics I want to move. Can I just use historical data, fit a linear regression model, and just say this delta y is the linear combination of these delta x? Uh, but the challenge here is you cannot just do regression. The reason is very elementary, uh, which I'm going to explain in simple cases. If Let's assume you just run a bunch of AA. So basically, there's no true movement, right? The key here is that uh, we w what we want, really want to do is do regression on these real effect mu, but we only observe delta. And the delta is the real effect mu plus some noise, OK? In the truly AA test, we know those two mu are 0. But however, there's still going to be non-zero correlation between the error terms. Those error terms going to going to make you feel like those deltas are correlated. Okay? And mathematically, you know, is this is a, a result of um, uh, you know, your error term is correlated with your uh, delta x. And you know, if you look at any linear regression book, it will tell you that you have this bias. And then you can even quantify the bias using the curves. Okay? And there's some uh, recent research to tackle this problem. These people try to treat this problem as a weak instrument problem in econometrics. Uh, the idea is just like the problem is the, not, you know, the low signal noise ratio. So why don't we just, if the delta is not large enough, we shrink it to zero and only keep, you know, do regression on these uh, uh, of the you know, very big delta, which we, you know, we know this. Uh, in those cases, of mu and delta are you know, a lot closer. There's also orthogonal approach. Ignore those statistics. Just treat, treat the problem as a optimization problem. Right? You have a set of experiments that you, you, you know there's an effect. You have a set that you're uncertain. You also have a set that you know there shouldn't be any effect. For example, these can be those AA experiments. You know they're not, right? Um, then from the optimization perspective, you, wa you want to find the combination of those test metrics to form a combo matrix so that it's new metrics can increase your rejection in these two sets, E and C, E and U, but then minimize the rejection in C. Right? Because in C, you are making a mistake, while in E, you are making a positive. In U, it's really uncertain, but this is an area you're think, you, you believe, you know, if you have more sensitive metrics, you will have, you know, some, uh, you have convert, you will be able to convert some of the U into E. Right? Um, but theoretically, the key is to be able to decompose covariance matrix of the observed delta into the covariance of the true effect mu plus the covariance of noise. OK, so problem of a p-value. So research findings are not reproducible. A lot of published research had this issue. Um, you know, more, most, the most surprising the result seems to be the less likely it's true. That's another 
tight requirements law in action. Um, and it's hard to interpret. This is just coming out late, uh, recently in a, uh, in a paper in uh, JAMA, this is uh, Journal of uh, American Medical Association, which is a pretty top tier medical journal. And it basically says this finding did not reach significance p-value equal to 0 0.054, but it indicates a 94.6 probability that something is blah, 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 blah. So you see the, the general theme here. People interpret 1 minus p-value as the confidence of the alternative being true. Right? This, that mistake even happens in these top tier um, the journal. Um, and then we talk about p-value hack. You can do you know, try to repeat until you hit p-value. Uh, a last mentioned problem is p-value doesn't allow you to accept the null hypothesis. It only you know, allow you to reject the null. Right? So if, if your desired result is to not reject the null, you can easily cheat by run a very small sample experiment. It's low power. You don't detect anything. But if you don't report how you do the power analysis, you, you basically uh, can cheat in this way. Okay? And, uh, and what we really want is, given the data, you know, what is the confidence, right? This is because people tend to you know, misinterpret p-value in this way. You, you sort of see that what people really want, what is easier to, for people to interpret, is the opposite. It's not the probability given the now that you will observe the data. It's the opposite that's, you know, given the data you observed, what is your confidence that the null hypothesis or the, the alternative hypothesis is true? Um, but then the other way is actually the Bayesian posterior. And uh, it's also related to the concept of the false discovery rate. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a better uh, evaluation of the confidence. And uh, a good thing about these two posteriors is that they also tend to auto-adjust for multiple testing. But the caveat here is that you need to sort of assume the movement of these metrics are independent. If you do a, a thousand tests and all these tests are independent, why? If I'm if I'm interested in the results of one test, why should I care about all the other 999 tests? Right? Why should I? Like in the in the p-value framework, you should, because you know you, uh, that's the multiple testing problem. But then the, intuitively, you, you know, you ask people ask this question: Why should I care if, if I know I, I'm only interested in this test and these are in, independent? Right, that also highlights why multiple testing is a hard, very hard issue, because it contradicts with the, you know, intuition of the human mind. Um, okay, so these are very standard uh, things. Uh, the math here is quite standard. Uh, the highlights here is that you need another piece of information, which is prior odds. Right. To do this exercise, you, you need to know what is the ratio between the probability of the alternative being true and the probability of not being true. And then, you, you, from the data, you calculate log uh, base factor, also is like a ratio, using uh, by conditioning on alternative and the now. And then you basically combine things up. These are very standard based belief updates. Okay. But the challenge here is that, you know, this. No one knows what is the true probability of the alternative being true and not being true, right? I mean, there's a, uh, if you know uh, Bayesian statistics, you know there's always be a subject of uh, controversy here, right? How, you know, what, what, what prior you put here? In our cases, you know, due to the benefit of a large-scale experimentation platform, we're running a thought more than a thousand experiment each month. So over a year, we have like 10,000 experiments. Right? So the idea is, can we learn these things objectively from these his rich historical data? And in fact, this is a way, if we assume, if we assume these, you know, if I'm running a new experiment, if I assume this new idea I'm testing is, is from the same distribution of those ideas I tested last year. Okay. Right? And then I can use the data, the historical data I did from last year to try to help me learn what is my true, the true probability of, the, of, of, of my idea moving the metrics I'm caring about, uh, I care about. 
And, uh, and the side problem is uh, also uh, we don't even know alternative. When we say uh, between now, we know that the now is there's no difference. But when we say there's alternative, I don't even know what is what is the effect I'm, I'm, I'm getting. So the similar idea is that if we have rich historical data, we can try to also infer the distribution of the treatment effect I'm getting. Okay. But the problem here is also, you know, I'm assuming I have a rich historical data. What if I just started? This is a classical cold star problem. Uh, how to know whether the historical experiment are similar to the current one I'm testing? That's another concern uh, people might raise. Okay, I, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, continuous decision making. Traditional tests assume a fixed sample size, a fixed horizon. You just do do this, and then you, you look at those sufficient statistics, and then there's some formula can help you calculate either p-value or in this case cal calculate the posterior. Uh, what about if you you want to stop this experiment randomly at a certain time based on some rule? Okay, uh, interesting uh, proof here we gave is actually when you change the time from a fixed time to a random time, the functional form f of this posterior remains the same. What it means is that you can use the same formula, just change the sufficient statistics originally, assuming you have a fixed you know, time horizon, change that to a random horizon. And it just worked. Okay? This is actually, the result is not surprising. This is expected. A lot of people are using this in practice. Uh, but the proof is still uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not trivial. Uh, the, the only caveat is that that random time needs to be a proper stopping time, which means the decision of whether you stop the data gathering at a certain point can only depend on the data known at or before that time. Okay? A violation of this rule is you, you, you gather data up to a later time t, and then you do a test, it's not good, then you search back to see, hey, can if I were to stop my experiment at this early time t, t1, I will get a good, better results. <laughs> then you pretend, you sort of pretend you stop at that time. Okay? Then this is this is the violation of the stopping time because your rule, you actually peak at peak later. Okay? And also, this results currently only only works for the Bayesian testing, for the you know the the, the null hypothesis testing, the frequentist uh, p value. There's a counterpart uh, called sequential analysis. I think there's a paper in this year's KDD uh, about this counterpart. Um, but they, if you look at the mass, they are very, very similar. And it also justifies the you know, uh, bandit, multi bandit using Thompson sampling. That's why I said this result is sort of expected, but just no concrete proof. Uh, your, your stopping time is determined by your exact sampling that you use, right? Nope. Well, uh, it's, it's it can be anything. Okay. The stopping time there's no uh, limitation in limit in what the decision rule should be, as long as your decision is only depend on the data before. So your de your decision can even be I want to stop at the first time my posterior is less larger or less than certain value, or my observed delta is larger than certain value, or my sample size is larger than certain value. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna first stop here to take more questions, and I think we are at the at the time. So if people, you know, th those slides are available online, so we can keep the discussion after that. Uh, we are gonna stay here for a couple more minutes. Any final questions?